So anyway, uh, as Dirk says, uh, I'm going to be talking about some preliminary results from uh, one of the projects on CSTAR. Um, the first project, which uh, I'm the PI on and my, my co-investigator on the, that project is, uh, is Dirk Denouten. So I'm going to be talking about biographical, behavioral, and neurological predictors of aphasia treatment outcome. That is, can we, based on baseline factors, can we predict how well somebody is going to respond to treatment? There's a little bit of uh, the background. I'm going to start by talking about a little bit of a historical perspective on aphasia treatment studies, uh, then talk about aphasia treatment efficacy and predictors of treatment outcome, what do we know so far. Then I'm going to get to our current data from CSTAR, talk about biographical uh, predictors, baseline test predictors, and lesion predictors. That is, can we predict outcome based on the pattern of brain damage among the participants? And if I have time at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about some issues that I think we need to address as we go forward with the field of aphasia treatment, in, our, in the field of aphasia treatment research, such as dosage and statistical power. So a little bit on the background for aphasia treatment. So um, Paul Brokers had two seminal papers that are uh, widely known, one published in 1861 and one in 1865. And they primarily, those papers are notable because in the first one, he suggested that damage to the posterior inferior uh, frontal lobe is associated with non-fluent speech. And in the second one, he basically cemented this idea that humans are left hemisphere dominant for language. But what is far less often talked about is that he, he actually uh, discussed aphasia treatment in that 19, 1865 paper. And he argued that the right hemisphere could be trained to overtake language function in aphasic patients with left hemisphere damage. And that the right hemisphere has the potential to learn language much like a child initially learns language. Uh, Broca provided aphasia therapy to at least one patient. Most people don't realize this. Broca was really an SLP, a budding SLP. And the patient showed improvements in vocabulary and reading. And Broca suggested and one of the main reasons why aphasic patients did not relearn language at a faster rate was because they also tended to have cognitive or intellectual problems that impaired the learning process. We still don't know whether this is the case. We always talk about aphasia, well, it's not a problem of intellect, but it is certainly possible for somebody that has aphasia that the same damage that caused that aphasia could also cause problems with cognition. So aphasia it by itself doesn't exclude the presence of cognitive problems. This was certainly one of the earliest accounts of aphasia therapy and demonstrates that it is, even as far as 150 years ago, it was recognized that persons with aphasia could potentially benefit from therapy. One of my favorite early studies of aphasia was published by Jules Desjardins and his uh, uh, mentee, Andre Thomas. And this was a single case study of a woman with uh, severe Broca's aphasia as a result of a middle cerebral artery stroke. There you see the high resolution MRI at the time, actually just taking a picture of her brain. But um, their therapy was focused on pairing single letters with production of correct of corresponding phonemes. There was particular emphasis on the participant observing the articulators of the clinician while uh, she produced the individual phonemes, and they called this the visual approach. The reason why I really liked this was because uh, the participant was required to either repeat or imitate the speech production of the clinician in real time, and maybe this is what something that we have called speech entrainment, something that was first, as far as I can tell, presented by Jay Rosenbach and colleagues as a part of treatment for apraxia of speech back in 1973. Speech entrainment, of course, something that we have studied quite extensively and uh, made popular really by Darlene Williamson in uh, sort of the current, uh, in current times. A little bit about aphasia treatment. Now, does it work? Well, this has been a very contentious issue through the years. Um, and this paper is particularly famous by uh, Lincoln et al., which was pu published in Lancet back in 1984. I have to say that 
when I got the preprint of this paper, it made me feel really old. Because if you look at this, it has like the yellow edges and it kind of looks like it could have just as well been published back in the days of Broca and Wernicke. But actually at the time that this was published, I was 15 years old. So uh, puts things in perspective. Um, by the way, this study included 191 participants. They were all in what we would now call the subacute phase of stroke, uh, at least 10 weeks post-stroke. They got two weeks, I mean, they got two therapy sessions per week for 24 weeks. And in a nutshell, they found no difference between treatment and no treatment. So this was a negative study suggesting that aphasia therapy, at least in the early phases, was not effective. Now, much more recently, a, um, um, a meta-analysis by Brady et al., uh, which was a part of a Cochrane review, suggested that there was some evidence indeed in favor of aphasia, aphasia treatment. And then more updated uh, meta-analysis suggested that there was more definitive evidence in favor of aphasia treatment. But what they also concluded was that we have very limited understand, well, we have very limited data on what is the best dosage, and we have no data to suggest that one aphasia therapy is better than another kind of aphasia therapy. Now, that brings me to a paper by Bradenstein et al., which was published last year in Lancet. Uh, I think this is probably one of the most important aphasia treatment studies that has been uh, conducted and published so far. Um, they compared treatment five days a week for three weeks to no treatment. Uh, in 156 participants who were randomized into two, group, two groups, either treatment or no treatment. They all had chronic aphasia, however, compared to the more sort of the subacute phase in the Lincoln et al. study. Um, what they found was that there was an indeed effect of aphasia treatment. Uh, for improvements in speech, they found a small, uh, a medium effect size or a Cohen's D of 0.58. And for improvement in quality of life, they, the effect size were small or 0.27. And you might say, well, that's not really a big deal. But when you're dealing with a chronic condition, I think that any improvement is important. And now keep in mind, we're only talking about 15 sessions total. So with 15 sessions, they were able to demonstrate a medium effect size um, of uh, aphasia therapy compared to no treatment. But hold your horses. So <laughs> there was a recent trial that just came out. This is the very early rehabilitation of speech trial. And this was an Australian trial on speech treatment in acute and subacute patients with aphasia. The PI is Erin Gudecki at Edith Cowan University. And these results have actually not been presented, I mean, have not been published yet, at least as far as I cannot tell, but they have been present, they were presented at the World Stroke Congress that just finished very recently in Montreal. And there, it was a negative trial. They found no benefit of aphasia therapy compared to no therapy. So could it be the case that the difference here in those trials is really when the treatment is being done, that is in the acute or subacute phase compared to the chronic phase. And in a very unscrupulous way, I'm gonna promote my first peer reviewed paper here. that was published with my mentor, Andre Holland back in 2001 in AJSLP, where we suggested that in the early phases of recovering uh, from aphasia, that speech language pathologists should be focusing most of their time on counseling and assessment of abilities to help people deal with a very difficult situation. Um, uh, Richard Peach, who is at Rush University, did not like our paper at all and wrote a, a rebuttal to it, and which we then got to write a response to. Um, and I actually was the first author on that. I have to say, going back and looking at that paper, I was very surprised at the very contentious tone of my paper as I wrote at that time. I would certainly not write it that way now. But one of the things that I said, so towards the end of the paper, I think this is actually the last thing that I said in the paper, is that structured language therapy appears to be more appropriate when aphasia has become a chronic condition and when patients can assume a more active role in their treatment. Now, so what I would say is that the Breitenstein trial is very important. 
certainly for chronic aphasia treatment, but the verdict is still very much out with regards to treatment of uh, acute and subacute aphasia. Now, one of the problems that we deal with in the field of aphasia treatment studies uh, is that there's a lot of differences across our studies, which makes it very difficult to compare the outcomes of trials. If you read the literature, you will see that different studies use different treatment types, the dosage varies a lot, the inclusion and exclusion criteria, and certainly the outcome measures. Very rarely do you find the same outcome measures in treatment study. They, certainly some of them have used the same outcome measures, but more often than not, it's something that those specific researchers thought was appropriate as an outcome measure rather than something that was agreed on on in the field. That brings me to this very important paper that just came out in the International Journal of Stroke. And this was a paper from a large group, an international group of researchers in the field of aphasia therapy. And over a four year period, they went through a major exercise in trying to figure out and come up with the best outcome measures for aphasia treatment studies. And they actually, in the end, ended up voting on what they thought should be the different outcome measures for language, communication, emotional well-being, and quality of life. And if you look there on top, for language, what they thought should be the primary outcome measure was the Western aphasia battery. It certainly is not a perfect outcome measure, but it's a test of language that I think is used very often in the, in the clinical setting and certainly very often in aphasia treatment research. Also, uh, with regards to quality of life, they suggested using the stroke and aphasia quality of life scale, the SAQOL39. That's the same quality of life measure that the Bratenstein trial used and showed a medium, I mean, a small effect size for. I think this is very important uh, in regards to what I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm actually going to show you that our measures, outcome measures, relate to overall outcome on the Western aphasia battery. Another final paper before I start getting into uh, the background literature for prediction of treatment outcome. Uh, this is a paper from Swathi Karan's group. Uh, it's in press right now in archives of uh, physical medic medicine and rehabilitation. What they did a very useful task in that they looked at aphasia treatment studies and uh, calculated what was the average improvement in different outcome measures. And what they found with regards to the Western aphasia battery, both in the signs that are within subjects and between subjects, that the average improvement in the WAB aphasia quotient is about five points. And I think that that's something that perhaps we can then use as what we would expect for standard of care aphasia treatment outcome. This is all very important for trials in uh, aphasia therapy. So what do we know about predictors of aphasia recovery? There is quite a bit of research that has been done on this, very little on the outcome of aphasia therapy, more on spontaneous recovery from aphasia. Most of the studies that I'm gonna show you here focused on spontaneous recovery. So these couple of studies, the first one from Holland et al., so Audrey Holland, and the second from Terry Wurst and Nina Dronker suggested that older age had a negative effect on long-term recovery from aphasia. Also education, uh, less education was also found to have a negative effect and women th were thought to have a better long-term outcome than men. Also this one study by Kathy Price et al. suggested that time post-stroke, so the further you are away from uh, the stroke, the less likely you are going to improve. Uh, with regards to aphasia severity, it's by and large agreed upon that more severe patients do tend to recover less. So the, the most of the, the recovery that we see, both treated and spontaneous recovery, is mainly in the patients with moderate to mild aphasia and that these very severe cases tend to show relatively less recovery. And that brings me to our data. So I'm gonna talk about the two main aims of project one, which we affectionately referred to as POLAR, or predicting outcome of language rehabilitation in aphasia. I think that is the acronym 
Is that right, Alex? I think so. Uh, we came up with this a long time ago, so I haven't looked at that in a long time. We always refer to it as polar now. But anyway, the aim number one is to identify biographical and cognitive linguistic factors that predict aphasia treatment outcome. And that is what we're trying to do here is to give information to clinicians in the field about the next person that you're going to be treating. Can you tell something about how well they're going to respond to therapy based on their baseline factors? And then aim two is to test whether the dual stream model from Hickok and Popple that most of you probably have heard of, um, whether damage to the regions that are included in the dual stream model, whether knowing how much damage there is to those regions improves our prediction beyond the biographical and cognitive linguistic factors. And we wanted to compare that to uh, damage to the old wernicke lichtheim geschwin model. Um, to see if there was any difference in outcome prediction. So essentially, uh, if we look at, let me see, will the arrow show up on the video? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So aim one is really this straight across. We're trying to take these baseline biographical and cognitive linguistic factors, put them together, then together in a default model and a predict aphasia treatment outcome. And then aim two is really to take damage in the dual stream model see if we can add it to the default model and then improve upon our, our outcome prediction. And then finally, we're going to compare that to damage to this old wernicke lichtheim geschwin model. So those are the two aims. Here's the study design. Uh, let me just walk you through this. Here on the top row is the timeline. So this is week zero all the way out to week 38. Uh, G1 is group one. So group one starts uh, the evaluation doing all the baseline tests during the first week. And then they go through three weeks of phonological treatment. So five, day, uh, five days a week, 45 minutes per session. Then they take four weeks off and then they cross over and do a, whoa, and then do a semantic uh, treatment for the same duration that they did the phonological treatment approach. We do assessment before and after each one of these three week uh, phases. And then we do another assessment at four weeks post uh, completion of the second treatment phase. And then again, at six months post. The data that I'm gonna talk about today is mostly focused on predicting the long-term outcome. And that is six months. And essentially that's what I think what clinicians and patients want. It's important to know how well you're gonna be doing immediately when the treatment is over. But I think really what people want to know is, does this last? So we're trying to tell not just people, well, you're going to get better, but that this is going to be maintained at some time in the future. And we selected six months, both mostly for practical reasons. Once you keep going out further than that, you're probably going to start experiencing things like major attrition. So I'm going to be talking about mainly predicting six months outcome, which for aphasia treatment studies, is not that common. Most aphasia treatment studies look at treatment outcome, let's say one week after, or maybe three weeks after treatment co completion. So we're looking out pretty far out in, in time. Now compared to group one, group two does exactly the same uh, phase with regards to the timeline, except that they start with a semantic treatment approach and then they cross over to the phonological treatment approach. So this is a crossover design. The only randomization that we're doing is to determine who is going to get the semantic and who is going to get the phonological treatment first. We do MRIs at baseline and we do it immediately after the first and second uh, treatment phases and again at six months. So multiple MRI sessions. Uh, I'm only going to talk about MRI data, however, at baseline today. The semantic treatment tasks. Like I said, these treatment sessions are 45 minutes. We have three different tasks that we think focus more or less on semantic uh, processing. The first one is semantic feature analysis. The next one is a semantic barrier task. And the final word, final one is called VNAS or verb network strengthening treatment. We are not saying that these isolate semantic processing somehow, but rather that they focus more on semantics rather than phonology. Uh, we went with 
treatment approaches that have been published in the literature, anything that is included as far as the treatment here is, is concerned is not something that was invented by us. This is something that we, we simply did a literature research and looked at the treatment approaches that we thought had the most uh, evidence behind their utility. The phonological treatment tasks are phonological component analysis, phonological production task, and phonological judgment task. So these are the three different tasks that we tackle in each session 15 minutes at a time, more or less. Now the outcome measures. Um, we look at two different kinds of outcomes. The first one is discourse. Uh, we have three tasks that we do at each one of the time points where we do uh, assess outcome. Um, these come from the aphasia bank, which is Brian McWinney's project. Uh, the, the tasks that we use are the Cinderella task. That is, you tell, you get a picture book and you have to retell the story of Cinderella. We ask the participants to describe how you make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And finally, they get a series of pictures about a boy breaking a window and the part participant is supposed to retell the story of what is happening in those series of pictures. The measures that we derive from um, these three tasks are content words per minute, verbs per utterance, propositional density, semantic errors, and phonological errors. We also assess naming. Uh, we, we look at both uh, items that are included in the treatment sessions. I'm not gonna talk about those items here today. I'm only gonna talk about items from the Philadelphia naming test. That's Myrna Schwartz's test. And so those are items that are not included in the training. So we're looking at generalization here. And for, from the Philadelphia naming test or the PNT, uh, we, looked at, we look at correct naming, phonological errors and semantic errors. Here's the enrollment so far for Polar. So we're about two and a half years into our grant period, just over that. And the total number of participants enrolled so far is 64. Three out of those participants are controls. Those are folks who have left hemisphere damage but do not have aphasia. Those are gonna be included in different kinds of analyses for different C-STAR projects. One person withdrew. So at this time, the number of subjects that have completed the study and we've done all the scoring for, which takes a, a long time to do, uh, there are 38 participants. So 60, uh, total that have been enrolled. So let's say six months from now, we'll probably be somewhere close to that number with regards to completion. Our goal is to get into at least the three digits with regards to subject enrollment before the project period is over. So keep in mind the prediction models that I'm gonna be showing you today are based on only 38 participants. So that's why I talked about this certainly being preliminary data. There's a little bit of a breakdown of polar enrollment as you, this is for both uh, sex and um, age. Most of our, uh, the age group with the most participants or 20 was 60 to 70, yikes. Hold on, bear with me. There we go. 60 to 70, uh, we've had one person who was under the age of 30 and then we've had, let me see, 15 participants in the 70 to 80 range. And we've had more males than men than women. Here's the breakdown of the aphasia types. Half of our participants have had Broca's aphasia, um, and then that followed by anomic aphasia, and then um, conduction, and then finally Wernicke's and uh, uh, global. We go to great lengths to maintain uh, study fidelity both with regards to assessment and treatment. I will say I'm not gonna get into great detail with all the things that we de do with regards to uh, fidelity, but to say that the sections on fidelity for Polar were written by Jessica Richardson. If you're interested in an excellent paper on this very important topic, Jessica published something in AJSLP a couple of years ago, and I put the reference down there. Jessica is now a, a professor at the University of New Mexico. The head honcho in charge of fidelity for Polar is Dr. Leanne Spell, who is the clinical director for our lab. And she really do, goes to great lengths to make sure 
that across the two sides where polar happens, which is University of South Carolina and the Medical University of South Carolina, that the clinicians are all indeed doing the same things. And the scoring that we do, we have multiple um, uh, com or communication sciences and disorder students that do the scoring. We want to make sure that everything, everybody's doing uh, all the procedures exactly the same way. So we assess, uh, we go through great lengths to improve or maintain assessor training, assessor delivery. Uh, we look at fidelity for the raters, so the folks that score the outcome measures, um, and also for folks, for the clinicians who do the treatment and assessment delivery. Also, in addition to that, we initially for Polar, we would meet on a weekly basis for all the clinicians and everybody involved. We've decreased our meetings now to once a month, which I think is ample to, uh, to maintain uh, not just sort of like the progress of the, of the project, but also to, to discuss things like fidelity. Before I go further, I want to acknowledge our excellent team of speech language pathologists on the project. Uh, Michelle Martin, Allison Croxton, Anna Doyle, and Sarah Sayers, they really deserve most of the credit for the excellent progress on Polar. And then Alexandra Basilakos, who was in charge of uh, actually doing the, the pre-processing of the, the outcome measures and get this into a, an analyzable format. Now, the reason why I talked earlier about the Western aphasia battery and the aphasia quotient of being an appropriate treatment outcome is that what I've tried to do here is to uh, simulate something similar. So instead of looking at each individual uh, outcome measure that we could look at here, uh, content words per minutes and so on, what we've done is that we've come up with an aggregate measure. So we've calculated a T-score for all the different measures or both discourse and naming and then we add them together and divide by the number of different factors to come up with an overall outcome. So what we're trying to come up with here is a measure of overall severity so that the folks who are hopefully showing the greatest improvement on this overall outcome are the ones that are experiencing the greatest improvement in language. So I wanna show you at baseline for those different measures from both discourse and naming I want to show you the correlation with aphasia quotient at baseline. And not surprisingly, that correlation is pretty good. The R squared is 0.485, so that the folks with milder aphasia score much higher on this outcome measure at baseline compared to the more severe participants. I also want to point out that the improvement, so immediately following the second treatment phase, and the improvement that is maintained at six months correlates very highly. What you see on the x-axis there are the change scores or the t-scores for change at six months compared to baseline. What you see on the y-axis is change scores for immediately post-treatment. So anybody below that regression line is doing a little bit better at six months than they were doing immediately post. Um, just to show you that people that tend to do better with outcome at six months that was maintained from immediately post-treatment. Um, I also wanted to show, because I showed you that slide earlier where we said that overall aphasia severity is associated with outcome. That was no different here. And that's what we've come to expect. It's not a strong correlation between the overall WAP aq And WAP aq for those of you who don't know, that's an overall measure of aphasia severity. The folks with the highest WAP AQ, so the least severe participants, tended to benefit more from treatment than the more severe participants. Now, I will say that, that is not, this is not a great predictor. The p-value there is 0.02. There were some people with fairly severe aphasia that showed very nice responses, and there were some people with very mild aphasia who did not respond at all. So this is a positive predictor but it certainly is not a great predictor. But because it was a predictor and it's been reported again and again in the literature, in our regression models that I'm gonna talk about next, we included always WAP AQ as a cofactor because we wanted to make sure that whatever regressions we were doing, we were not simply showing an effect of severity. So keep that in mind when I show you the regression models. 
the way that we did the statistical modeling here, we used a module from SPSS called Automatic Linear Modeling. This is just sort of like a fancy uh, regression modeling approach. Uh, but what it does that is, I think is particularly nice is that it has a nice way to treat without, nice way to treat outliers. And it also groups together different factor levels. So let's say that you have factors with a, a categorical or an ordinal scale, it will group together different uh, levels of those factors to come up with the best predictors. We chose to go with best subsets as predictors, and we used what is called an overfit prevention criterion, where the best model was selected based on training of 70% of the data and testing uh, on 30%. So going to the first aim um, for regression analysis, I realize this is a lot of factors that we're putting in there, but the factors that we tried for biographical predictors was the NIH stroke scale. That's an overall measure of uh, stroke severity. It does correlate somewhat with overall aphasia severity, but the correlation is not great. We also looked at sex, months post-stroke, stroke age, test age, depression, whether participants were taking antidepressants, race, handedness, education, exercise, and diabetes. The results from that, this is the R squared, actually, or percentage of the variance explained. This regression model didn't do great. It was statistically significant, but we only explained just uh, about set over 17% of the variance. Uh, the regression, the scatter plot for that prediction was not particularly nice, actually kind of ugly. And the only factor that uh, came out as being significant there was the tended to be exercise. Now, I will say there's something a little bit sinister going on here in that what automatic linear modeling does is that it takes the different levels of exercise. This is how often somebody says they exercise per week. I don't know how many of our participants part, uh, exercise seven times a week. I think can think of at least one, but not many, but what it has done there, if you look at the x-axis, on the left, those who exercised once or twice, they didn't do as well as those that exercised never, which is zero, and those all the way up to seven, which is why I said it tended to. So this is just something that automatic linear modeling does, um, but there seems to be some correlation here with overall exercise. Now, I talked earlier about aging and the higher age is associated with poor outcome, both, both spontaneous recovery and treated. I looked at aging just separately as a single predictor of outcome, and indeed it is correlated with improvement in polar, so overall improvement. So our participants who are older tend to respond less. So our youngest participants, and you can see clearly the youngest participant who, who that is there, those people tended to do better in treatment. But We've done several different treatment studies here through the years. So I went back and I looked at those treatment studies to see if this factor would actually hold up. This is from our recently completed TDCS trial, same kind of an analysis. It's not statistically significant, but, but there's certainly a trend that the older you get, you respond a little bit worse to therapy. And finally, one of our first treatment studies, not statistically significant, but certainly folks who are older seem to do a little bit worse than their younger counterparts in treatment. This is not a great predictor, but it does seem to influence treatment outcome. Finally, a paper that we just was accepted for publication this week with uh, Lisa Johnson, who is a PhD student in our lab as the primary author and working with Alexandra Basalakos. And what they found was that for predictors of long-term recovery from aphasia, looking at our database of folks who have been in our studies over a long period of time, if you look there in the second line of the, the outcome, age at stroke is a negative predictor of just long-term outcome. So that folks with who are older tend to show less long-term recovery than their younger counterparts. Not a fantastic predictor, but the effect, I think that across multiple studies and based on the previous literature, uh, the effect is there. Now, what about cognitive linguistic factors? I think this is, for clinicians, this is sort of the de facto way that we think that we can predict outcome. But if I do my baseline tests, 
I can then predict how well somebody is going to do with whatever treatment approach I am going to select. And for this purpose, we looked at a practice of uh, speech severity on the ASRS, a, a practice of speech rating scale from Edith Strand and, Edith Strand and Joe Duffy et al. Uh, we looked at dysarthria severity also from the ASRS. We looked at the matrix reasoning test for sort of a cognitive test from the, the ways. We combined the pyramids and palm trees test and the kissing and dancing test from, uh, for semantic processing. One deals with nouns, the other one deals with verbs. The reason why we averaged across the two is because the correlation is very high. If you score low on the pyramids and palm trees, you almost always score low on, on the kissing and dancing. We looked at verb naming and verb comprehension from the Northwest, Northwestern aphasia um, battery for verbs and sentences. That's Cindy Thompson's test. And finally, uh, phonological processing from the PAWPA. So for the cognitive linguistic factors, we still didn't do very well with predicting outcome. We could only explain about 18.6% uh, of the variance. The scatter plot looks a little bit more respectable than before, but the best predictor here was the, the verb naming test, that those participants who had higher scores on the verb naming test at baseline tend to do better in treatment. Now you could say perhaps that's because of things like Broca's aphasia, but also keep in mind that we do factor out here, just like before, uh, the WAP AQ, so overall severity. And then finally, with regards to uh, the speech and language measures, we looked at whether the baseline measures themselves, the discourse measures and the naming measures at baseline, whether those were related to how much participants improved uh, on the overall outcome measure. So these are the same measures that I showed you before from the discourse and naming, and we did much better here. Uh, we were able to explain over 40% of the variance. Um, the scatter plot certainly looked pretty nice, and there were two factors that really mattered here. The first one was uh, correct naming at baseline. The more you can name at baseline, the better you tend to respond to therapy, but also the more phon phonological errors you make a baseline, the better you respond to treatment. Those seem to be, that seems to be a little bit of a contradiction, but those were by far the two best predictors. I, actually, let me rephrase, those are not by far the best predictors because many of these things correlate, okay? But they seem to be complementary at least. So when we look at the default model, so going straight to the middle here, uh, we actually could predict knowing how well somebody did on the baseline measures, we can tell even six months after treatment is completed, based on only these 38 participants, we can predict fairly well how you're going to respond to treatment. Now, we looked at also whether damage to the areas in the dual stream model and the wernicke lichtheim model, uh, whether those improved outcome, and that was not the case. We saw no improvement in the actual uh, prediction. So therefore, we tried something different. There's Grigori, a uh, picture probably taken in his early 20s, a long time ago. <laughs> but Grigori is the master of machine learning, and we used his approach uh, for support vector regression. And if you're interested in this method, Grigori has published two excellent papers on this fairly recently. The first one is Journal of Neuroscience, uh, published in 2016. Another very much related uh, paper that just came out in Cortex this year on support vector regression approaches. So we used a leave one out cross-validation approach. For the overall outcome, however, we got no significant results using lesion location as a predictor of outcome. So lesion location using SVR does not help us uh, predict uh, overall outcome. However, when we look at just changes in correct naming, which is a common outcome measure in aphasia treatment studies, we've certainly used that in many other labs. Um, we did get some nice results. Uh, this is for uh, predicting changes one week post the second treatment phase compared to baseline. This is the correlation between actual scores there on the x-axis and the predicted scores on the y-axis. So the correlation here was 0.47 or almost 0.48, and that was statistically significant. You might say, well, that's not fantastic, but 
This is only based on um, 30 plus participants. The areas that predicted had the greatest predictive power was the supramarginal gyrus, those patients with damage to the supramarginal gyrus, which you see there in orange, those were the participants who tended to uh, benefit the most from treatment. However, participants with damage to the posterior middle and inferior temporal gyrus were those that tended to respond very poorly. Now, I think that's very interesting. I saw somewhere, I think it was on Twitter this week, actually, there's a nice uh, study by David Popel et al showing that the posterior middle temporal gyrus seems to be very important for uh, word learning. It could be the case that if this area is damaged in aphasic patients, it makes it more difficult for them to reacquire lexical items. At six months, the prediction was not as good, but it was still statistically significant. And here, the map didn't look that different. Uh, still, the supramarginal gyrus was the best predictor and the posterior regions there in blue or the areas that were associated with particularly poor outcome. Okay, so a um, little bit of a discussion here. So with regards to N1, biographical and cognitive linguistic factors, biographical factors provide moderate predictive power. They don't do great. Uh, same thing for base, baseline neuropsych and speech and language tests, they improve and I, and I don't really think that I can say that they improve. It's a marginal difference in improvement in, in prediction. But the baseline scores themselves uh, provide by far the best prediction. And they're an R squared of over 0.4. For a study with not more participants than that, uh, I think that that's pretty good. Because we are trying to predict something really far ahead of time, out, out, out in time with regards to clinical <coughs> practice. Bless you. With uh, for AIM2 for lesion predictors, uh, the dual stream and Wernicke Lichtan Geschwind models, at least as we set it up in our hypotheses, these do not provide complementary um, predictive power using the statistical uh, approach of automatic linear modeling and SPSS. However, SVR, uh, we cannot predict overall outcome, but we can predict changes in correct naming on the Philadelphia naming test. It could be the case that as we keep adding more participants and our statistical power goes up, that we'll get closer to what I think is a, a nice outcome measure, and that is this overall outcome measure, uh, overall uh, uh, change in overall outcome. Uh, I just said this. I I really think that we are probably at the the study is certainly underpowered. There's no doubt about it. We are gonna keep plugging along with our data collection. We still have quite a bit of time to add more participants. Uh, we would really like to at least uh, get into the hundreds uh, with regards to total enrollment. Um, we can perhaps use line, baseline data to predict outcome. The future goal is really to come up with a model that we can then publish and tell speech language pathologists that are working in the field here are the tests that you need to do if you want to understand how your participant is going to uh, respond to treatment. And I think that's very important for, for uh, this next bullet there. With regards, with regards to guiding treatment, what we work on as speech language pathologists are basically two things. One is restoration of language. That is, that we want to improve somebody's ability to process language. And the other one is compensation. That is compensation for the impairment not necessarily by improving the language itself, but also but providing some kind of a, a different method or an alternative approach that enables somebody to communicate more effectively. What, what I'm hoping that we can do with this compre comprehensive uh, prediction model is to say, look, here's the next patient that came in, you do your assessment. For somebody who has very good treatment potential, let's tackle, let, let's do uh, therapy with impairment-based uh, aphasia treatment. For somebody that we think is not going to uh, respond based on this prediction model, and obviously we have to do better than how we're doing today, let's focus on compensation. I think that that's really where we need to go. Uh, we don't know yet whether treatment type matters. We are looking at both phonological and semantic-based treatment. 
we are working on this. Uh, Grant Walker, who is a postdoc on CSTAR, has started looking at these data. He says he has some promising data, so I would say that watch this space. Maybe it matters what kind of treatment you give to what kind of uh, a, a person with what kind of uh, impairment pattern. But I think we need certainly more power to be able to do that. Um, a little bit on the considerations. I actually got through this quite a bit faster than I thought I was. So good, because this is going to be my favorite part. So when John Krakauer, he gave a talk here a couple of weeks ago, and he talked about some of the things that he, he considers challenges for motor recovery and stroke. And that reminded me of many of the discussions that we've had in our field with regards to aphasia recovery uh, and many of the deficiencies that we've had to deal with and how we can do better. The effect sizes that we typically see in aphasia treatment studies tend to be small to medium. Um, and we still don't know really whether we're improving quality of life. The Breitenstein study is, in, is encouraging, but I'd really think that what most patients are looking for are much larger effect sizes than what we have been able to demonstrate so far. And given that, for example, the participants in our study they're getting six weeks of therapy. That's for most Americans that get rehabilitation today, that's probably far more than what they get out in the rehabilitation setting. So if they are getting aphasia therapy and we can uh, uh, transfer these effect sizes from the, from the lab to the rehab setting, then those participants are probably responding even less, which is not great. Now we touched on the restoration versus compensation issue on the previous slide. Um, should we be working on in language impairment or should we, should we be working on compensation? And I think that in the 1990s, at least that's when I see it happening, there started to be greater emphasis on compensation. So not so maybe going away from uh, impairment-based aphasia therapy, but rather focusing more on what can I do to give the person some kind of a scaffold that can help them improve their communication, perhaps um, regardless of whether their language improves or not. I still think there is heavy emphasis on restoration in most of the aphasia treatment research, but that brings me into the last thing there, which I think is by far the most important one, is that if you look at the animal literature on stroke recovery, so these are where the, the stroke is induced, for example, in a rodent, and the rodent is then trained uh, to regain limb function, for example. Those studies include far more sessions than anything that you would see either in research studies or in the clinical setting when we're looking at recovery from, from, uh, from motor impairment. So in the animal studies, you may say, see 150 sessions to see some kind of recovery. And oftentimes in these animal models, we see very nice response in those animals. And we think, oh, great, brain plasticity is happening. That's what is happening when I'm doing therapy. But it's probably likely that the dose plays a very important role here. Uh, I suspect that most aphasia treatment studies with regards to what is optimal dosage, that they're underpowered. Um, I liken this to treating a severe headache with 20 milligrams of Tylenol. Well, it probably is better than nothing, but in most cases, it probably doesn't help you at all. And then we think, oh, let's do intensive therapy. So instead of giving somebody 20 milligrams, we're going to give them 40 milligrams. And still, that's probably not going to improve your function very much. I think what we need to achieve at some point in aphasia treatment research is really to give somebody who has a headache 500 milligrams of Tylenol. We haven't reached that level. I think that's something that we need to build towards. I really think that if we want to focus on restoration, which I think is what we have to focus on for the future, because that's what every aphasic patient wants. They want to regain the function that they lost. I know that we talk a lot about, oh, they got to be able to communicate. That's very important. But what people with aphasia want is restoration of function. And then that will lead to improvements in quality of life. We need to build our models so that we can build our treatment studies that we are giving a lot more treatment that we're doing right now. That of course, the one of the limitations to that is that that's very difficult to do, it's very expensive, but also 
that's not realistic for the rehab setting today. If you go to any rehab hospital today where somebody's getting a fascia therapy, they will not get 150 sessions. That would be a, 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 an extreme case. So any stroke patients that you see over at the hospital right now who's gonna be transferred over to rehab, they will not get 150 sessions. That just doesn't happen. But I think that if we wanna, if we wanna see meaningful gains and if the animal studies are any kind of an indication of what we can see, we need to up our dose and maybe those studies will then help us change policy. But right now, I think that our outcomes are fairly modest uh, and in some cases, great. I mean, some patients do very well, but I think we can do a lot better. So I'm gonna stop at that and, and uh, take some questions if you have any. So uh, one question I have is that uh, most of the factors that you're looking at uh, to assess the degree of recovery or what factors contribute to recovery, it seems like something critical is different types of treatment, right? Isn't it critical to investigate a wide range of different possible treatments and to assess that quantitatively? Because, I mean, you can imagine that maybe it doesn't really matter, you know, which particular part of the brain is damaged or those other factors, but really what kind of treatment there is. Yes, absolutely. So we don't know what kind of treatment works for whom. Um, and there are many reasons why. One of the things is that nobody's done a large treatment study like what we're doing right now. I think this is a good first step, but ultimately what we want to be able to say, if treatment doesn't matter, if biological treatment is no better than semantic treatment or vice versa, maybe it's just that you need language stimulation. That could be the case. And I'm totally open to that. I don't think that's going to be what we're going to find. But I think that's one of the reasons that we need to have larger studies so we can enroll people in different kinds of therapy. We always think, oh, the impairment should be, the, the treatment should be tailored towards the impairment. Do you know what? It seems, intuitively, it seems right. But we have very little evidence to suggest that. That's how it goes. Suda? Okay. Sorry I cut you off earlier, just for the taping purposes. Sure. Uh, the, the question I had was when you were talking about the study where they randomized 156 patients mm -hmm. to those two uh, groups, and the effect size was pretty small, right? Yes. So I was wondering, the persons who are randomized to no intervention, there is nothing that happens to them to make them feel that way. So the intervention group would actually be a placebo effect because they are be engaged in something. Yes, so what they did, what they was actually pretty nice, is that they had a delayed treatment. So the folks who actually did, were in the randomized to no treatment, then they got three weeks of treatment, just like the initial group. And they showed very similar changes. So far greater changes during those second three weeks compared to the first three weeks. I think that's their way of dealing with it. And a little follow-up to it. Yesterday there was, I think, some study which was indicating that when there is uh, upper limb uh, you know, uh, involvement in stroke and um, the uh, rehabilitative, intense rehabilitative efforts for the uh, upper limb rehab actually improved, dramatically improved aphasia uh, response. Mm -hmm. So do you have something to say about how yeah. your study might so there are people have to repeat the question. Oh, sorry. So the question is, uh, there was a study that showed that uh, treatment of, uh, of upper limb function, uh, so in, in motor recovery, actually improved uh, aphasia, <coughs> aphasia severity, essentially. So this has been shown in other studies. Uh, I'm not familiar with exactly the same study you're talking about. But I think the idea is that motor recovery of any kind, that this actually also stimulates the regions that are important for speech just because of their close proximity with the regards to motor organization. That, that, I think that's the prevailing hypothesis, but we, for example, have not looked at recovery in motor function in our fascia studies, and maybe that's something we should do. Chris? So you talked a lot about different predictors of outcome, like patient age, exercise, uh, uh, initial severity, and some of the brain imaging, but you're, you're 
tree and study. It also suggests there were some genetic factors. Do you have any idea uh, for the if, if some of those things you found in the brain stimulation also carry over to this work? Yeah, so we have it right now. It's a great question. So uh, Sifus Christensen, which is one of our uh, PhD students, is actually looking at this in more detail. So uh, in the TDCS study, we found that the BDNF genotype was actually related to how much patients responded to TDCS, right? What we have found is that the overall aphasia severity in chronic stroke, and we published that in a, a paper in brain stimulation, that, that um, the overall severity in long-term recovery does seem to be related to BDNF genotype. We are looking at this in polar as well. We haven't included it as a predictor, but we have added people from polar to our TDCS study. Is it like 89 patients now? So with with 89 participants, we find a very clear difference in language measures, but not in other measures with regards to uh, impairment severity. Um, by the way, the question was, uh, how do genetic factors relate to predicting outcome? I think that we don't have the power yet, at least in the TDCS study, BDNF genotype was not related to TDCS, I mean to the aphasia treatment response, only to the brain stimulation. But whether this is a factor in the aphasia treatment itself, I think we need a lot more power. But at the very least, if you're looking at long-term outcome, it does seem to be the case that folks with atypical BDNF genotype recover less, or at least they're more severe in the chronic phase. Yeah, just uh, you, you may have mentioned this, but in terms of the, the biographical factors, I'm curious about the, the role of gender, whether you might be finding or if you find any traces of differences between how men and women might respond, um, and then maybe if, if that if there's some confounding at times, particularly the older age group, so there tends to be more of the women that are, are older in the sample. And I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that and, and your thoughts. Yeah. yeah, so Spencer has a question about the, the role of gender in outcome in a facial treatment study. So there are a couple of older studies that suggest that women respond better. This is an interesting thing for us because we get far more men than women as participants. We, our sample is basically self-referred from the community. I suspect, and Leanne, maybe you can chime in on this, I suspect that wives are much more proactive in finding treatments for their husbands than husbands perhaps for wives. I don't know, but um, we haven't looked, I haven't looked at it specifically, whether that's a factor in response, but it does seem to be a factor, at least for us, with regards to who is looking for treatment. Question online uh, from uh, Heather. Uh, for the support vector regression study, did you control for overall lesion size and does that relate to outcomes? Not just lesion location, but lesion size. Uh, you know, that's a great question. I think Grigory usually controls for lesion size. Do you do you have an idea, Chris? He usually puts it as a feature because it's a good predictor. Yeah, predictor. I, I think it was included, but I would have to ask Gregory. Unfortunately, he's, he's scanning right now, so I, I'm not completely sure. I'm pretty, I, I suspect it is because he almost always includes it as a feature in the analysis. I should know that, but I'll, I'll definitely check on that. We have another one here from Svetlana Avirina. Great talk, thank you. What were the exclusion criteria, especially in neurological aspects? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, our TDCS trial, we had quite a bit of exclusion criteria. We excluded folks with second strokes, uh, people with very severe aphasia. What we tried to do here was to be much more inclusive. Um, you cannot have had a right hemisphere stroke, but you can have had more than one stroke. And the reason why we do that is because we're trying to make our results reflect the general population. There are so many people who've had multiple strokes and we felt like even though it might make the prediction better uh, and our models better, that then we can only then generalize that to people with a single stroke. But as we all know, the best predictor of stroke is whether you've had a previous stroke. So we include folks with very severe aphasia global aphasia, um, we exclude 
Yeah, our main exclusion criterion is um, right hemisphere stroke. Also, if you you have to you have to be test you have to test aphasia. So you have to score below the cutoff on the Western aphasia battery for aphasia. So we have we have the whole range, everything from severe global aphasia into folks with mild and no aphasia. I have a separate question of my own. For, so I know that this is something that we've talked about in the in the group as well, but can you talk a little bit about how comfortable you are with the composite measure of treatment outcome given that so it basically assumes that all the the T values that you put in will have a positive correlation with outcome, right? That's why you can sum them and divide them and take the mean. But what if one of those has a significant and important and meaningful negative correlation with feedback? Yes. So one of the things that I failed to say earlier, by the way, is that we reverse the sign for the errors. So that when we were adding them together, we actually changed the, air, the sign for the phonological and the semantic error. So we assume that a reduction in error is actually making you better. Does that make sense? So when we added them together. Just so that high scores would really reflect that you're getting better. I would say that there are pros and cons with the overall outcome measure. Um, I would say that the folks that are, if you look at a scatter plot, like in this case, with rela in relation to uh, uh, WAP AQ, the folks that are on the far right that, it, that had the highest T scores, my bet would be on those are the folks that are showing the greatest improvement, but there's definitely some granularity that we're losing. So in the, as we get more data, it is definitely the plan to look at the individual outcome measures and then how those relate to the overall outcome. Can people, by the way, hear your question? Yes, I think so. If it's loud enough, then they can hear it. Okay. Yeah, if it comes from the back of the room. What? So that's why I think you get the opportunity to kind of take a broader perspective on these issues. So that sort of feeds into my question, which is, you mentioned about the issue of uh, like restoration of function versus compensation, with a big focus on restoration, particularly because this is what patients want. But I mean, it's natural for a patient to want to regain what is lost. Yes. So how much of it is a burden on us to communicate the degree to which they may not recover function, to, to communicate that information to patients, you know, so that they have expectations, or obviously you don't want to, you don't want to depress expectations unnaturally, but how much is it uncommon to communicate that? No, it, it's, I don't know how common it is for clinicians to actually communicate that. I think that's something that we address with our folks that when you're coming here with chronic aphasia, the likelihood that you will ever completely recover from this is very low. And we always try, we tell everybody who comes in, we have no idea if this treatment is gonna be worthwhile for you. You can give it a shot, but we can not guarantee you any improvement. How often that is done in clinical practice, I think you should. I think you should tell people that, especially if you're in the chronic phase, if you have uh, certainly moderate to severe aphasia, the chance that you're at some point going to be whole again is very low. And I, and like you said, you don't want to, you don't want to kill any hope that they have because you want people to keep working on improvement because, like I said earlier, even a small effect size could make big differences for quality of life. So if you keep, in, keep working on it, Maybe how you are going to be two or three years from now might be a little bit better than how you're right now. It may make your life better. But to tell somebody, well, this is how you're going to be for the rest of your life, I don't think that's the message even that we should be getting people. But definitely, I think there's been a lot more emphasis on counseling in communication sciences and disorders training, speech pathology training. And I think that that's where we really need to address this with students. Uh, we need to give very realistic expectations to our patients. And I think to piggyback on that, I think clinically, clinicians have such restraints in regards to what, how many visits they get with a patient. So, I mean, you can't just do intensive therapy like we would like to do, so you've got to do a combination. And I know Stacy can speak to that being in rehab as well, but, you know, you have X number of visits, and you've got to do what you can do in those however many visits you have. So m much of that has to be compensatory strategies. Yeah, I mean, my, just from my perspective, I think that rehabilitation in the United States is in very, 
is very much hampered by the medical model. We always think that, well, if you don't respond immediately, therefore it's probably not going to be worthwhile. We have Mika van de Sam, who's a colleague, a, a colleague from the Netherlands who came here to visit us. And in the Netherlands, you can get aphasia therapy for at least two years, for example. They had an aphasia house, and this was something that was paid for by the state. And, you know, I, I think that if you keep going there and you keep getting therapy, I see no reason why you're not going to keep improving. But in the United States, this is just not a possibility. If you go to an, infect, an intensive aphasia treatment program, and there's many of them out there, you may have to pay $10,000 plus out of pocket. And how many people can do that? So I think that this touches on not just the science, but also on policy. Huh? Um, you, you mentioned about the uh, the improvement in aphasia therapy and how long it, had la it would last. Has anyone done, done a study on the types of aphasia therapy uh, and, what and their improvement levels? So right now, um, yeah, so the question was about with regards to long-term improvements with aphasia therapy, and this relates to what we talked about earlier with William was saying, does the treatment type matter? Right. And unfortunately, we don't have any data on it. We don't so, know. Yeah, we, study, uh, yeah. That's right. No we, need, done the study. we need more studies on what therapy is best for whom. It could be that, like I said earlier, it could be that just language stimulation, that kind of therapy is, is good. But I suspect that the type of therapy probably matters. And I think we will get at, we will have at least some answers to those questions once we get a lot more data in our project. Because we are really comparing two types of therapy. It's very broad, it's very broad, but um, at least when we get to, I would expect 100 plus participants will, will We'll start to be able to answer some of those questions. Because there are probably uh, a lot of mixes in yes. this. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you.